my first name. Uh, being recorded. Got it. All right. I consent. So um, it was started in 2003 by a, a person named Slava Pestov, and I uh, bumped into it um, not too long after when I was seeking out a language that would uh, bend my mind a little bit as a programmer. Um, it's a concatenative language. It um, influences, you know, I would say just come from fourth Lisp and Smalltalk. Um, it's open source. Uh, we use the BSD license for everything. And it's interesting because it's, uh, it, it has a small core and a lot of libraries that extend that core in different ways. And I'll go into some of that soon. Um, we have a style of interactive development that I think is, um, is interesting and derives a little bit from the image-based nature of the language. Uh, the current release is a little bit old. It's 0.98, but we have an upcoming release 0.99. And if I get my way, we might have a 0.100 at some point. Um, what are version numbers anyway, right? <laughs> uh, so I can show you some of the concepts behind Factor. And um, feel free to interrupt if you have questions. This can be an interactive thing. I have uh, maybe half an hour of stuff to talk about. And then Doug's got some things as well. So as I mentioned, concatenative language, um, we have a whole object system and, and the concept of dynamic typing. I'll get into that. The syntax is incredibly extensible. Um, I'll show some of that. The uh, factor programming language is fully compiled. Uh, so we'll be able to disassemble functions. It's cross-platform right now across uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows um, and has CPU support mostly for Intel platforms uh, with some beta support for ARM hopefully coming soon. And we've had PowerPC um, backends as well that uh, probably are a little bit bit rotted at the moment. I find that um, I like to describe factor as clickable um, and hopefully it can be useful as well. Uh, so some examples of the cat concatenative language um, and I'll kind of show you how this works. You guys have probably seen um, code like this before, uh, one, two plus, and, uh, and a period outputs the numbers three. And it has a data stack. You can push the number one, push the number two, do the plus operation. Now the stack has a three on it. You can print it out. Um, so it's, it's a concatenative language. Um, we have a lot of libraries and those libraries are available to use a programmer, for example, calendars. So three weeks ago at noon uh, was this date and time time zone, um, and that's an object representation, a tuple, and I'll get to that uh, in a bit. We've got support for networking um, in the HTTP client library. Uh, you can print that out. It's not that interesting. Um, it's a bunch of HTML from our factor website. Um, we also have this notion of uh, quotations, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, but you can run things multiple times, you can take a sequence of numbers, calculate an average, which is the sum divided by the length. And so Factor's just got a lot of built-in functionality. And um, I will show you a little bit of something that looks familiar, defining words. So Factor has uh, word definitions that are defined at parse time. And there's a distinction between sort of the parsing of a source file and then the running of that source file. So this is a pretty simple word definition. The word palindrome uh, takes a string, produces a Boolean, uh, question marks kind of shorthand for that, that's the stack effect. And it's a palindrome if it's equal to its reverse. So we can define that word and then we can test it. So maybe AAA palindrome. And that produces true, maybe BA palindrome produces false. So these are kind of a Boolean notations, T and F. Um, and what's nice about factor um, is it has kind of the concept of pervasive unit testing. So we can write these two unit tests. Hello is not a palindrome. So we expect it to be false. Race car, which is a cool one, uh, is a palindrome. We expect that to be true. And it runs the unit test and confirms that there's no errors. Otherwise um, it, would, uh, it would have said so. Um, in addition to that, <laughs> you might wonder about the stack effect. In other concatenated languages, these are kind of like comments. In Factor, uh, these are used, and you'll see at the bottom, press F3 to view errors. Um, and if I can press, oops, press my F3 here, 
on this keyboard. No, that's not working at all. Um, I'm going to switch to a different keyboard here. Uh, no, that's not working. Well, anyway, um, so show errors. Uh, errors. Yeah, I'll go back to it. But anyway, it's a stack effect error, and I apologize that my keyboard here is not working. But what it says, it says the stack effect doesn't work. It expects this to take one thing and produce one thing, but you've told me it takes one thing and produces zero things. Um, and fixing it is just a matter of correcting the stack, stack effect definition. It's show error list. Show error list. All right, thank you. Show error list. It up. So um, let me go back and just show you that error just for completion. Thanks, Doug. So if we mess up the stack effect, we get an error here. I made my font sizes all ridiculously large for the demo. But if you look at the bottom, <coughs> stack effect declaration is wrong. So we have real-time stack checking of uh, your words. And um, there's an asterisk on that when it comes to what we call combinators. But when you fix the definition, those errors go away. Um, so it's a kind of very integrated development environment. Quotations are uh, unnamed blocks of code. So you can actually take a piece of code, hello world print, we can call it, prints the word, hello world. Um, and a lot of our combinators, what we call combinators, which are words that take quotations, uh, like for example, if, uh, operate on these blocks of code. So this statement 10, we dupe it, we check if it's less than zero. If it is, the true quotation subtracts one, the false quotation adds one, and, um, and the if, uh, word uh, takes those quotations and then runs whichever one is appropriate. Um, and we have a lot of sequence operations and operations on data structures. So here's an example of a mapping operation. Um, and so we go across this array of numbers and we make sure that they are at least as big as zero. So all the negative numbers get turned to zero. Um, and those quotations are pervasive in the factor language. Uh, Factor has a ton of vocabularies uh, that are built in. We have this notion of kind of a mono repo, and um, <clears throat> we love contributions. And over the years, we've gotten a ton of contributions. Um, we have uh, a lot of very kind of core things like um, arrays, byte arrays, growable byte arrays, which are byte vectors, growable arrays, which are vectors. Uh, there's a lot of uh, support for different kinds of classes. Um, data structures like hash tables and hash sets. I'm not going to go into all of this, but as you scroll down through the vocab list, there's just a lot of useful libraries here, um, in addition to support for the different operating systems that we work on. And I'm going to give you some demos of these vocabularies in a minute. But first, a example. So <laughs> I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Fortune program. Um, Fortune prints out a random thing every time you run it, which is pretty cool. So I wanted to build that in Factor. So let's try this. So this is where my local Fortune's package is installed. And um, I'm going to print out life is difficult, two rights don't make a wrong, some other stuff. So the Fortune code works pretty well. But one of the questions you might have as a programmer is how does it work? So we can set a breakpoint. And we pops up this thing we call the walker, which is kind of a debugging tool. And for the sake of showing you this, let's have them kind of side by side. So the walker um, has some operations at the top. You can step through it. You can step into words. You can step out of words. You can go backwards. And you can kind of continue to the next breakpoint uh, or abandon the whole computation completely. So um, if we just step through this code, the next thing it's going to do is push a string to the stack, which is the path to my fortunes file. It's going to push ASCII. And ASCII, in this case, if you click on it, um, is an encoding descriptor. Uh, That's part of the clickable nature of factor. The next thing it's going to do is uh, grab the file as a list of line, an array of lines. And that's uh, now this array with, I guess, 3,000 some odd lines in it. And this is, you know, all the fortunes that are stored in this file. Fortunes are separated by these percent characters. So you'll see percent characters, a few lines of a fortune and another percent character. And so we can split that array on percent characters, grab one at random, 
and print it out and you'll see, hey, it worked. The world is moving so fast these days. Um, but you're like, that was cool. Wait, I wanna go back a second. And let's print it out again. Oh, that works. If we go back, maybe we can get a different random one and print that out. And you're like, wow, that's kind of cool. Um, you know, there's the ability to uh, walk through your code, see what the data stack and the retain stack um, look like at different points of operation, maybe figure out a bug, um, save this uh, as a continuation to be looked at. You can look at the um, a bunch of variables about that computation at that point in time, details of which uh, to be discussed later, and uh, and do stuff. And you say, oh, well, I don't care. I'm just going to abandon abandon that process, um, stop it where it was, and uh, and then go on to the next slide. <laughs> so Factor has something uh, something approximating native performance, and I'll give you uh, an example of that. So uh, counting the number of lines in a file, kind of a basic thing. Unix has it built in, uh, wc-l. So there's, uh, in the Factor image file, there's 93,000 some odd uh, new line characters. Um, it takes all told about 130, 140 milliseconds to run. So like, that's pretty cool. I wonder how long factor takes. So if you just do the naive thing, um, this is kind of a simple line counter and I'll walk through it very shortly. Um, we read a file as binary and uh, this disposal uh, basically makes sure to close the file after we're done with it. And it runs the code in the middle. So we start with zero and over each block of the, the file, we just count the number of new lines and add it up. So um, we can define that and run it. And we get the same result, 93,000 uh, lines in the file. And you're like, well, that's pretty good. 375 milliseconds. I don't know if you remember, but um, C was like 139 milliseconds, it's pretty good. We have a little bit faster version of that that's maybe, um, uh, if this was five lines of code, um, the faster version is maybe 15 lines of code. And that one takes 35 milliseconds, which is pretty awesome. Uh, there's a small asterisk there, which it works a little bit differently uh, due to the use of SIMD instructions. Um, but factor can be incredibly fast. And we have a deployment tool where you can actually make these things as binaries. And I did that earlier. I won't do it right now. Uh, it doesn't take too long, but um, so this is a binary that was created from a piece of factor code. And uh, it's, it's pretty fast. It's, it's mostly the speed differences in the user um, column, but instead of 130, 40 milliseconds, it's 80 milliseconds. Uh, so yeah, so it can be a competitive language performance wise uh, with some effort. And by default, the naive way is usually two to three X, maybe what you'd hope it to be. Factor has a development environment that I've been using uh, this whole time. So that's this, we call it the listener. And the listener is kind of a graphical REPL. So it reads your input, evaluates it, um, prints it out maybe, and tries again, it loops around. Um, but it's graphical in the sense that it uh, produces graphical output. Um, it's not just text. Um, and that text can have attributes associated with it, like background colors. Um, it can be images, like the Factor logo, which is behind us, <laughs> Doug and I. Um, and it can even be live, uh, you know, live gadgets as well. So here's a kind of a funny demo that um, was made that just prints the current time as sort of an LCD kind of thing. And it's live updated. And when we clear it out, Factor is smart enough to dispose of all the resources attached to uh, all the things you previously had displayed. Um, and I wanna show you an example of kind of the typical development workflow. So, um, this was a demo that I think Slava may have done in the past. It's kind of cool. We play Tetris because Tetris is fun. So works kind of like a normal Tetris game. Uh, I'm not particularly good at it. Um, it's kind of hard. Uh, so let's pause it and make it easier by cheating. So we can edit uh, this Tetris file. This defines all of the characters that Tetris has. And maybe we say, instead of a random tetronomo, let's just get the first one. And so we have a workflow where you can change the code, 
you refresh it, whoops. Um, and this Tetris is the same Tetris we had before, but now it's only gonna give us the best character ever, the one that gets you the Tetrises. But you're like, oh, that's really messed up. It's uh, kind of has all that stuff from the last time. So let's just start a new game. And then maybe Tetris is easier now. <laughs> And uh, you can revert that change, refresh, and it'll go back to its normal state. Um, it's a live environment with live coding and interactive development um, in a way that allows you to kind of work through a problem by inspecting the code, inspecting the data, uh, modifying your code and solving problems. Um, and that workflow is really just that. You write some code, maybe interactively, maybe in a file, you edit it, you test it, you refresh, test it, and repeat that cycle. Um, so factor as a language uh, has the notion of parsing words. The word definer colon is a parsing word, and I'll show you some others in a minute. Um, but it allows a very extensible and flexible syntax. Um, it allows some, some parts of it to look like a domain-specific language. Fourth has this characteristic very much, too. Um, and I'll show you how factor's version of this works. Um, there's really two types of parsing words. There's the ones that create data types like an array brace. Um, and there's another category, which is arbitrary functionality um, that's made simpler uh, looking um, by the use of parsing words. And sometimes these parsing words can actually be pretty complex themselves. Um, so let's look at uh, arrays. So this is an array and it's an array of two numbers. And behind the scenes, it's basically a block of memory, which is a length, and then a series of pointers to factor objects, or actually just pieces of memory. Some of those can be um, very much look like a native word sized thing. Um, we can see how this brace works. You're like, well, what, what the heck is brace? Well, brace is a syntax word, and that's the, the word name, open brace, and this slash pushes the next thing on the stack, so it looks for an end brace and everything in the middle, it parses it as a literal and converts to an array. And that's pretty cool and you can step through it. But if you want to see how our hash tables work, our hash tables look for an empty brace, an ending brace, a closing brace, parse as literal as a literal and convert the in-between parts to a hash table. And so there's um, byte arrays work very similarly. So our syntax, um, and many factor words you'll find are these kind of one line simple definitions. Uh, they can be easy to write. So we can make some custom syntax. So I'll walk through this. So this is an arrow and um, we grab the parse stack, which I will just call that for the moment. We pop the last thing off of it. We scan the next thing. We turn it into an array of two things and push it back on the stack. And so if we define this, you know, we can have an array one, two, but we can also have the array one, two. Um, and we've just created custom syntax, which acts upon a parse tree and produces a result after it's, uh, after it's run at parse time. So the syntax is super flexible and dynamic um, and allows you to do some kind of fun things. So as a first example, the dice vocabulary was kind of a, a, a simple example um, and a fun example for people that are following uh, Dungeons and Dragons and different kinds of things that are popular in current media or past media. So we use the dice package and you can do a lot of damage and it's dynamic, um, but you're like, what is this roll colon thing? So roll colon is syntax. And so the roll colon syntax scans a token. Factor is white space delimited. So it scans the next token after what, skipping white space. In this case, I guess I did 2d8 plus 5. Calls this roll quote uh, word and then appends the result to the parse tree. So roll quote, you can inspect, um, parses the string into a roll, which is the number of dice, the number of sides, the number that you add. And then it kind of curries it up into a piece of code that makes a random roll. And you can see that by looking at a quotation, which includes the roll syntax. And the result of that quotation doesn't look like roll colon. It's um, not homoiconic in that sense, but it does the two, eight random roll plus five 
uh, for you. And, and the shorthand version can be convenient for uh, some people. And we use that in a few other places. So a regular expression library, which is also written in Factor, um, has kind of two versions. One is you can build a regular expression from a string at runtime and see if it matches. And it does. Uh, I mean, that example does match this, the, the regular expression. But, um, but what that code is actually doing is when you run it, it's parsing the string, creating the regular expression, compiling a match block of code that will do the matching and then doing the matching. And it'd be much better if that happened at parse time and we saved the result. And so we have syntax for that. Um, so this is a regular expression literal uh, that the R slash is itself defined as syntax. And at the end of parsing the regular expression we'll insert into the parse tree, the compiled regex. Um, and so, at runtime, uh, you won't have that parsing delay uh, when you're using it, so it's more efficient. So that's kind of a good use of the word, a good use of syntax forms. And so you can see that syntax parses the stuff that's in front of it as a regular expression. Um, and we use some other cool kind of cool examples, XML. So our XML library is written in Factor. And um, these are, XML syntax, and you can think of it as kind of an interpolating operation. So this will map across the sequence of strings um, an XML interpolation, which will take each item, wrap it in a list uh, item, take the resulting sequence of uh, XML chunks, wrap that in an unordered list, and then print it out. And so you can see three blind mice. And that uh, XML structure was built through interpolating using uh, XML syntax. And um, like anything else, you can, and I won't go into it, you can look and see how XML interpolation works by walking through these pieces of code and asking yourself, what is this by clicking on it? And uh, deep diving as far as you want into all the things that the XML library does. Um, Again, kind of the clickable nature of factor. Uh, it has uh, something which is kind of useful. We call it local variables or lexical variables, um, locals for short. Um, and uh, albeit stack languages are amazing, sometimes there's not a great stack solution to a problem or maybe you don't know it yet. Um, or sometimes maybe you're porting code over from a applicative language, you know, C, Python, Java, whatever. Um, and you kind of want to just get it done. Um, one of the tools you have in the factor language is what we call locals. So this is an example of a combinator, like if or while or when, um, something that takes quotations. And uh, in this case, so the word is called branch. The double colon in the beginning is factors uh, parser for a local definite defined word. It takes two things, A and B. Well, it takes five things, but it takes two things, A and B, that it uses for comparison purposes. And then it takes three quotations, a negative quotation if A is less than B, a positive quotation if it's greater than B, and a zero quotation if it's equal to B. And um, I don't know about the languages you work with uh, concatenatively, but that's a little bit more complicated to do uh, with stack operations. Um, so I'll kind of show you how that works. So we create the branch word. And we can look at it, and it looks just like we we typed it. Um, locals don't have a performance penalty; um, they're pretty efficiently compiled. So we'll look at this example. So I made uh, this word for checking your voting age. Um, some places I think let you register at 17, vote at 18. But anyway, we check it for 18. If you're under 18, sorry, um, maybe you should just be an advocate. If you're 18, register to vote. And if uh, you're older than that, well, go on and participate in our grand dem democratic experiment. And um, we can define it and check voting age. Oops. Check voting age. Um, and we can see that it works as we expect um, using kind of a locally defined branching uh, combinator. 
Um, and as I mentioned, uh, maybe briefly, there's no performance penalty. Uh, the result is compiled efficiently and um, locals are entirely implemented as a library uh, in factor the same way word defines word definitions are. It's uh, not that different. I think uh, Brad might have a question. Yeah, I can't see it, Doug. So if you can look for the questions, because I'm only sharing my screen. Uh, Brad? Uh, I think you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Sorry about that. Um, uh, earlier, you showed something that was sort of more like a type a type declaration for the parameters, and now here you, they're locals. What's the? How do the two syntaxes interact? Uh, if you could show me the type declaration, where where was that? The, the one where it did the stack effect checking. Ah, um, so the stack effect checking. I think that was my palindrome example. Yeah. So um, this is not a type. It could be anything. Ah, I got you. Um, and I'm going to show you in a second uh, where we actually can provide types um, in our stack effects and use them, uh, which will hopefully answer your question. It is called string because one of the factor conventions is that if it happens to almost always be a string or that's your requirement, you might as well call it a string or a sequence or a number something um, descriptive that's not maybe a type, but could sometimes be a type. Um, but yeah, so if this is if this thing takes something which has a, a useful label and a type, uh, both of those would can be done this way. Cool, um, right. Yep, and I will show you a good example of that in a moment. Uh, dynamic variables. So there's a lot of features of factor uh, that are, enable building and solving problems, uh, building code and solving problems. One of them is dynamic variables. Um, we have this notion of getting a variable and setting a variable. Uh, and we use that in a lot of places. So in a particular place we use it are the input and output streams. And it allows us to write a word like read line and then not care with a small asterisk, uh, whether it acts upon a string that we read from or a file that we read from. So we can read a line from the string cat, new line dog, new line fish, returns cat, which is what we'd expect. And that same read line can uh, read from a file reader, uh, factors license as in this example, and it's in UTF-8 file encoding, and it grabs the first line of that file. Um, and the way read line works uh, is it uses get. So it says, essentially, it allows you to have simple looking code that's very flexible. So read line will get whatever the current thing that the input stream is bound to, and then pass it off to an actual uh, read a line from a string from a stream word. Um, and so uh, you can write code, this inner block, this inner quotation, excuse me, that um, you can then have a user be able to call it on any kind of input stream whether it's a network, a uh, file, a string, something else you have, a database, um, and it's uh, made generic across those, those things. Uh, and part of how that works, um, because if you see in this example, file reader, nothing in here opens a file, nothing in here closes a file, nothing in here you know, from the outside allocates memory, cleans it up afterwards. Um, we use a package we call destructors uh, for that. And um, in one of my earlier examples with counting lines, there was a with disposal word, um, which disposes of a, allows you to use and then dispose of a single object. Um, the more general form of that is with destructors, where you might have uh, yourself allocating memory um, and then freeing it afterwards. Maybe you have two blocks of memory, maybe you do a bunch of work in the middle, maybe you call a C function. And then at the end, this ampersand free and free will make sure that when this block of code exits, either because there's an error or because it was successful, um, that the memory is cleaned up properly and we don't leak resources. Um, and that allows high level code like your file reading 
to look very simple and the complexity is kind of pushed down a little bit um, and, and then tested. Regarding performance, uh, let's look at a short example. So calculating Fibonacci numbers, a uh, pretty simple word. We basically can see what is the first Fibonacci number, the second Fibonacci number, third one is progresses as you'd expect. Um, we can see what the first so many Fibonacci numbers are. And so, yeah, the function works. We could write tests for it, but let's just assume it works. Um, but as you get up in uh, higher and higher numbers, the 40th Fibonacci number uh, is embarrassingly slow, <laughs> one over a second. And, um, you know, I, I picked 40 because if you go much higher, it, it progressively degrades. But let's see what's going on. So we have profiling tools. So we can profile uh, that operation. And we can print out the profiling details. So it took a second and a, oops, 1.6 seconds. Um, and we see that almost all the time is in math type stuff. So comparing numbers that are greater, if it's greater than subtracting numbers, adding numbers. Um, and so, whoops, let me just clear this out. So, um, there's uh, two ways of looking at it. So I just looked at the flat profile, but we can also look at it from a call stack perspective, make my screen bigger. And you can see the sort of fib calls, fib, 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 it's fib all the way down. And then we kind of like recurse back up the stack doing math. Um, and that is probably not great, uh, but let's make it better. So one thing we can do, um, is making it better by using type declarations, which gets to Brad's question. Um, so we can define a typed word where we specify that the input's expected to be a fixed num, which is essentially a, on a 64-bit machine, like a 64-bit number. And we can try to see how fast that is. So 40 fib is, oh, wow, it's a third of the time, 0.6 seconds. That's not still not great. Um, but that's a lot better just by removing some of that, um, the math, the generic math, by knowing that your numbers are numbers, <laughs> integers. And um, if we profile it, we can see that the comparisons and the subtraction code went away. And if you'll notice um, at the top of this, this comparison is your incoming number greater than one. We subtract one, we subtract two, we add them together. So now all of the iter iterative uh, math is efficient, but this plus is still really slow. And in addition to that, um, we haven't solved the recursive nature of this function. Um, we can make it a lot faster by using memoization. And factor is one of the libraries you have, like a typed words, you can have memoized words. And if we do that, we can uh, see that it's super fast. And in fact, it's so fast, we can now get the 10,000th Fibonacci number and print all of its digits to the screen. Um, and so memoization is a bigger win than types because it's a smarter algorithm. <laughs> There's other ways to do that faster, but just as kind of an example of the flexibility of factors libraries, Things like the typed word, things like the memoized word um, are all very simple syntax that you can look at, click on, understand, and, uh, and use in your program. Uh, some of those use macros um, to implement them themselves. Um, Factor has macros, which are basically words that create quotations. Um, they expand the quotation at parse time slash compile time, and then insert the resulting quotation into the stack, into the, the parse tree. So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, kind of clear this all out so we can start fresh. Macros, um, this is an end dupe macro. So if you have something on the stack and you want to dupe it, and then you want to dupe, 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 dupe it, maybe you are tired of writing that, maybe. Uh, you should write that. So for endupe, um, 
And if you had one, let's see, we have hello on the stack and we dupe it four times, it works as expected. And when you look at your code, you're like, well, that's cool. What, what is the end dupe thing there? Well, we can push for end dupe and we can infer its output. It does it's what we expect, takes one thing and dupes it four times. Um, or five, I guess, in my example. And we can expand all those macros. And what the compiler is seeing is dupe, 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 um, the correct number of dupes. And, uh, and so macros are a really nice way of getting high level behavior that has sometimes a variable stack effect uh, and then inserting a static stack effect into your code. Um, so n dupe, and this is implemented by making a quotation that's just dupe n times using this replicate word. Uh, and we, we use macros for a lot of generalized uh, functionality um, in the core. It's not, uh, there's not that many words that use macros, but their functionality is kind of useful um, for expressing non-static stack effects. So you wouldn't have to have, you know, one array, two array, three array, you could have n array. And so you only have one word that, um, you know, can be operating, um, you know, multiple ways instead of having n words. Uh, so we have these grammars, um, just a hint of, so EBNF notation, and these parsing expression, uh, parser expression grammars. Um, and they're kind of cool. They allow you to uh, parse a string, outputting something and using that something to build complex code. So as an example of that, printf is something I contributed a bunch of years ago um, to factor. And we can run it. So the string factor, uh, we'll start from the year 2003 and see how long it's been. And then we'll print that out. And if you're familiar with C, the printf uh, format strings from C-like languages, um, this should look familiar, but this string is this integer years old. So factor is 19 years old. It's almost its birthday <laughs> this year, 20 years old. Um, and it's, what's kind of cool about printf is printf is implemented as um, a macro, uh, as an EBNF expanded macro. And this is what it outputs to and uh, compiles to. And I'm not going to go over the details of what this is. I want to show you a simple version of printf, uh, which is here. So this I blogged about um, after I first did it. It's kind of a, a reduced version of printf. It doesn't support all the format strings, but it gives you a sense of it. So this is an EBNF grammar. And on the left side is a label. On the right side is the thing to look for. And then if it matches, the thing all the way over to the right is, um, in this case, uh, a quotation. So if, you if you're matching uh, percent percent, that means the literal percent. If you're matching a C, it's a character. If you're matching an S, it's a string that we present. If it's a D, it's an integer that we want to print out. If it's an F, it's a float. X, it's a hex, that kind of thing. So you have strings and numbers, which are groups of, of uh, parsers, effectively. Um, if, it's an, uh, if it's something else, we just throw an error. Uh, all the formats start with the percent uh, character, and then we uh, parse these categories, um, plain text is everything else. And then text is a catch-all for formatted strings or plain text. And when you run it, uh, when you run it through that EBNF code that's generated, it outputs a block of quotations, which you can then use to uh, build your compiled function. So EBNF notation is used in a few places for complex parsing logic. Um, in this case, to implement the functionality of parsing the printf format string at parse time and then inserting into the code the resulting efficient version of that, um, which is pretty cool. Segwaying slightly from all the parsing stuff, I want to talk briefly about our object system. Um, how are we doing on time? We look pretty, pretty good. I'll sort of speed this up. Um, so Factor has a tuple syntax for creating objects with slot attributes, named values. And this is an example of it. Um, so you might have a rectangle with a width and a height. You might have a circle with a radius. We can define those. If you're curious, uh, you can see what tuples are. Um, but 
for the example, let's just say we have these classes, um, a rectangle and a circle. You can create a new rectangle. Um, and this is the syntax for printing it out. And if you look, it's got a false width, false height. We don't have it. You can set it width of 10, the height of 15. We can also create that um, using what we call BOA notation by order of arguments. Um, so that uh, instantiates it by passing it all the required slots. Um, in factor land, we have these constructor words. Um, this is a convention for constructor words. And if you don't happen to need to modify the inputs at all, you can just store them in the, in the tuple directly using the BOA words. But that's kind of handy um, if you happen to have any logic or if to do something um, with your arguments before you construct your instance of that class. You can do it inside the constructor words. Um, but what these uh, objects classes allow us to do is create generic logic. So we might have an area function, um, area of a rectangle width times height, area of a circle, pi r squared. And you know, if we make a rectangle, we can print out its area. If we make a circle, and notice I use BOA and not the other thing, we can print out its area, um, not the constructor words, just to sort of show two different examples. Um, but the generic word area dis dispatches on the type of the object you pass it, um, which uh, is used quite a lot in the factor uh, framework. We have um, some of the things I wanna talk about today is new things in 2022. We've got a pull request that's gonna implement, uh, we have multi, multiple dispatch, which is dispatching on the type of more than one object. Um, but we have a pull request that's hopefully gonna be merged for 0.99 that integrates it with our single dispatch to make just dispatch and provides a lot of extra functionality. Um, and I'll give you a demo of that using rock, paper, scissors. So. This uses our multi-dispatch uh, syntax words. So we create a word beats, uh, takes two objects, and then we have um, implemented it for different combinations. So scissors beats paper, rock beats scissors, paper beats rock, any other combination is false. Um, and so this word now will dispatch off the type of both uh, objects on the stack. Um, so we can play a game. So we'll let the computer pick rock, paper, scissors at random. And if it beats, uh, if we beat it, we win. If they're equal, we tie, otherwise we lose. And then you saw printf earlier, we are going to print the result out. Um, and to make it simple, we'll make words rock, paper, and scissors, which push the rock symbol play, push the paper, paper symbol and play, push the scissors symbol and play. And we can play our game, which is kind of cool. Um, and I'm sure at some point we would lose. Yeah, there we go. Got a loss in there. Um, and so multi-dispatch is kind of a new thing that's coming uh, hopefully soon. Uh, but in addition, the object system supports duct typing. So if you have two tuple classes, tuple instances that have the same, a slot with the same name, like length or name, <laughs> things that are common, you can write code that uses that slot and will automatically work on objects of both types. Um, objects themselves are not hash tables. The notion that we call slots, um, named slots, uh, they're compiled behind the scenes into um, memory offsets. And so their access is very fast for setting and, and retrieving their values. Um, but what we do support is that you can reorder and redefine those tuple slots at runtime um, and when you do, that's when things are a little slower because it walks mem all the instances in memory and updates them uh, according to what your new redefinition is. A bunch of other features that I think I'm gonna just kind of allude to here, predicate classes. Um, here's an example where a positive predicate class is a type of integer that is greater than zero. Negative ones are integers less than zero. And then you can actually dispatch off of a predicate class. So the absolute value of a number, if it's positive, is itself. If it's negative, we can multiply it by negative one. And if it's anything else, which is in this case, the zero case, uh, you just return it. Um, and uh, maybe not the most efficient way to implement an absolute value operation, but it's a nice example of how predicate classes work. Um, and we use those in a, in a, in a few places. 
and lots more. Um, you know, you can have tuples that inherit from other tuples. Uh, we can provide types in the slots. You can specify them the slots are being read only. Um, there's a bunch of different types of classes and we use reflect you can use reflection if you happen to be happy with the slight performance loss for the gain and maybe the simplicity of your code um, and it's all implemented in factor uh, as most things in factor are if we want to jump down to a lower level uh factor allows break you break break sorry to interrupt but uh we're already sort of five minutes past your uh ah. All right. Allocated, and we, I, I assume we still need to get to Doug. So, uh, thank you for keeping me on. Can we time. impose upon you to, to converge in like 10 or 15 minutes? Even less. Uh, I'll show this quick example. And yeah, thanks for watching the time, Kevin um, or Brad, or whoever's we're talking. A uh, quick example of assembly. You guys are low level guys. So, here um, and gals. So, uh, here's a quick example. And I'm just going to do it a little faster than normal, but you can actually inline assembly into factor. Um, this is grabbing the timestamp counter out of the CPU. And um, if we run it, it works as you'd expect. It's kind of monotonically increasing. And if you look at the assembly that's generated for that word, you can see that aside from a prologue and epilogue, we embed the assembly that you specified right into the uh, compiled output. So you have the ability to go low level if you want. You have the ability to go high level if you want. Um, you have the ability to call C functions very simply. This is the square root function in math.h. And all you have to do to call it is uh, define it this way, function colon. And our FFI takes care of the details. Um, people have done some crazy stuff with factor. There's an infix vocabulary that allows you to define words um, that look like this. So this takes X and Y and returns square root of X plus Y to the third power. I don't know why you'd want to do this, but it's kind of awesome that we have it. Uh, and we have an inline version of that as well. Um, if you happen to want to, something complicated and you uh, insert in the middle an infix expression that works. To wrap it up, uh, factor is 12,000 lines of code in its uh, VM, all C++. Most of that is kind of OS inter integration, memory management, some garbage collection, and a few primitives. And it's a lot of factor code, 300,000 lines of factor code, 80,000 lines of tests, 70,000 lines of docs. And um, we love any and all contributions. And there's a place for small and large ones in the tree. And we take pull requests and patches. Um, project infrastructure, I mentioned the factor code website. We run the concatenative language wiki as well. Um, we've got online documentation, a, a blog planet, a place bin. All of that runs on factor, uh, a factor server using our libraries. A build farm that we use for releasing and uh, converging on Doug's uh, part of it. I can't cover everything, obviously, and not this much time, but you can run the demos. There's a bunch in the, if you download Factor, you can do demos run, but why don't we look at a real program? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Doug. I started using Factor in 2005 and have been contributing since then. Um, I wrote a little Wordle clone. So um, Wordle is a game where New York Times just bought it and you can try words. And I don't necessarily want to spoil today's word because there's only one per day. But if you hit enter on it, uh, here, I'll just do this one fourth. So it says F, R, T, H are not in it. And O is in it, but in the wrong place. And if it were in the right place, it would be green. So that's kind of what I'm going for here. So I started this yesterday and uh, wrote a little Wordle clone. So the way I started this is I'm like, OK, you need to make a game loop. So I started writing this word. Um, and then you need in order to run the loop, you need the game state. So I made a game state. So you have a secret word, the number of chances that you will uh, take before you lose. And then we want to save all the guesses because uh, the board is there every time and you can you know, see where you've used and what you have left. So I made a constructor. You give it your secret word and the number of chances. And this is one of the... Um, 
ways we write constructor words with, you know, sort of like an opening HTML element. Uh, you knew it, you swap it and set this chances slot, set the secret word slot backwards, right? Because that's on the top. And then we make a new vector of the guesses and then we return the game. Okay, so moving on, uh, we wanna maybe stop. So if you're out of chances, then we're gonna stop and print the word in red. So you've lost. So maybe stop is, okay, someone asked about quotations. So the way the control flow works in factor is if you're not gonna run it immediately, like dupe runs immediately, maybe stop uh, runs immediately, but then this is a quotation which gets deferred. So it gets pushed to the data stack. So it's just a block of code that's on the data stack. So this word pushes two blocks of code to the data stack and then calls this uh, combinator by and games on the stack. So this quotation gets game and then this quotation also sees game, right? So it's a way to thread game through without using dupe over swap, things like that. Anyway, that's the stop condition. And then um, the next part is we are going to print your progress so far. So print guesses. Uh, this is where the algorithm to come in, comes into play. So you need like the rules of the game. So you get the secret word out and you get all of your guesses. Now um, that's using this by combinator again. And for, we're going to iterate over the guesses, each guess, and then with says, we're gonna keep this word on the top of the stack. So each, each time through this quotation, you get the secret word and your current guess. And I'm gonna maybe gloss over this because it's a little involved, but the way you tell your progress on any one guess is there's green word, green letters, yellow letters, and gray letters. So we do the green ones first and remove them from the set. Um, and then you're left with the letters that you didn't perfectly guess the right letter and the right place. So that's this step. So we zip it. If they're not equal, we'll filter that out and then make them into strings. Then uh, we go through this again and we assign green if it like, each character of secret and each character remaining, or sorry, in your guess. And if they're equal, then you got it green. If they're not, then we have a set of letters that are yellow and we're going to, um, what's that? Oh, we're gonna remove the letter. If you got the right letter, but it's in the wrong place. And if not at all, then you have a gray letter. And okay, so then we go here, read the guess and so dip like stores the top of the stack in the retain stack, calls this quotation and then returns. And so the top is game or game and we get the guesses out and push the guess onto that. Now I could have made this a word like um, get guess or something, right? And then get guess, game, guess, or you know, game like that. You can just copy paste it into a new word like in fourth, which is cool. And then the last thing we do, okay, so this is another combinator. Try, if by does two things with game on the stack, then uh, try is doing three things with game on the stack in this case. Uh, we check if there's a winner because we just got your guess, right? If, if the, uh, let's see, check winner. So it gets the last guess and then sees if they're equal. And if they are equal, it prints your secret word in green. You did correctly. And if not, we're going to loop. Play word roll is the same thing. So that's pretty much how all of these work. Yeah, that's all of this code. The words we're going for are from the official list from when the game was first launched. They released it in JavaScript. And so um, let me show you how it works, how it looks. Uh, there's a main, you can run this vocabulary like Wordle, Wordle run, uh, let's see. Okay, what's the guess? 
So uh, treat, treat uh, something. <laughs> uh, do, okay, so we got three letters right, two letters wrong, die, and then I don't know. The real word makes you. The real game makes you guess real words. Uh, I tried to pull in the dictionary, and it doesn't have like plurals, so you can't say rains and things like that. The Linux dictionary. Uh, I don't really want to play, but uh, um, I'll just lose. Okay, so my word was dirge. Uh, the last thing I did this morning for the presentation was like, if I had more time, I was going to say. You want to see the remaining characters. See, you have a keyboard here and you've used these. Um, you can tell it from the board, obviously, but uh, if I copy this in, I had it ready to go and then I typed something, so. So you go here, you save it, refresh it. Oh. oh, I can't read my screen really. All right, well, suffice to say that there's a version that I'll publish and it has which letters you've guessed and which ones you haven't. Uh, the other thing that was interesting just now is I was looking at the Unix dictionary and you can see the official words and then all of the five length words in the dictionary and we can take a diff of those so these are words in wordle that aren't in the dictionary in on unix and these might be like answers one day that you're going for but there's like how many 91 words that aren't in the unix dictionary for some reason or another anyway um, that's my part of the presentation. Uh, thank you. I uh, am going to have to be a little bit of a stick in the mud, although I really relish the opportunity for uh, questions and the resulting dialogue. I'm pleased to welcome you guys back, both of you or either of you. Uh, drop me a line. Uh, but unfortunately, we're about to. 15 minutes or more uh, past the allotted time for your talk. Kevin, if I could just if I could just quickly say, <clears throat> we have a mailing list and a Discord and an IRC channel, and our email addresses can be provided through Kevin. If you want to get in touch with us afterwards, please do. Um, we love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Send it to me and put it.